Good afternoon and welcome to Under My Tree. Today we look at Journey Part 15. Are you scared to take possession of the promise? Are you scared to walk into your promise? We're going to look at numbers 15 and 14 and then we'll go into a discussion. All right, well, let me find my little... All right, and before we get into that, let me just um, let me just mention a promotion that we're having in December. It's called Book Fiesta. Here is the video. Con Amen. All right. So spread the word to any author in the Christian genre that you know and uh, so that they can participate. We have very reasonable rates. And without further ado, let's get into the word. Numbers 14. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Oh, let me let me just go to Numbers 13 to the end. Uh, come on, computer, work with me close that okay so numbers 13 says the 12 scouts explore canaan verse 1 says the lord now said to moses send out men to explore the land of canaan the land i am giving to the israelites send one leader from each of the 12 ancestral tribes so moses did as the lord commanded him he sent out 12 men all tribal leaders of Israel from their camp into the wilderness of Paran. These were the tribes and the names of their leaders. And they listed all of the, the 12 tribe members. I'm not going to go into all of that, but one from each tribe. These are the names of the men that Moses sent out to explore the land. And he called Hosea, son of Nun, by the name Joshua. Moses gave these men instructions and he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like. Find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. See what kind they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls? Or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. And it happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob near Labo Hamath. Going north, they passed through the Negev and arrived at Hebron, where Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, all descendants of Anak, lived. Now, Anak, Anakim's were the giants. The ancient town of Hebron was founded seven years before the Egyptian city of Zoan. When they came to the valley of Eshkol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes so large that it took them, two of them, to carry it on a pole between them. Now, I'm going to read that again, you know. When they came to the valley of Eskal, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that right, but they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes, what we would call a bunch of grapes, but so large that it took two of them to carry it on a pole between them the fruit of the land that okay that place was called the valley of eshkol which means cluster because of the cluster of grapes the israelite men cut there now i'm going to just pause right here we may not get through this this is supposed to be the last of the journey series but we may may not be the last when god makes you a promise first of all he is not promising you anything 
that cannot be a fruit. All right. Secondly, you have to scout out what God has promised you. So, because you need to know what obstacles you're going to come upon. You need to know, um, will I be able to plant in this soil and, and get rich fruit? You need to know if you have enemies there. Um, how are the, 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 the persons who are already occupying this space? How are they operating? Because you might have to go fight them, not literally, but you might have to strategize and you might have to plan how to get around them, how to get through them. These are the obstacles. So the enemy is what obstacle is in your way. All right. So let's say, for example, the Lord says, Sylvia, I'm going to give you a store. And this store is a clothing store and it has the best and it's going to be in this place. What Sylvia would have to do is start researching. That's what scouting out means, you know. So I start researching the stores that are already in that place. I look at how they are marketing, how they treat the customers, how they are, how, how do they handle their goods? How do they package their goods? What is the staff like there? Because I have to learn about these stores and how they operate, how they interact with their customers so that I know how best to operate. All right. So it would suit me to go into one of these stores and buy a sample of what they are selling. And I, I get to see all of that. I don't have to tell anybody, oh, you know, I'm going to um, open a store like this one, you know, so just checking out. How, no, you go and you spy out the land. You research, you look at their internet profile, you see if there are any complaints against them. What kind of complaints are, are you getting? How are they dealing with people? I mean, if somebody poor looking comes into their store, how do they deal with it, right? So I'm going to continue now. So the scouting report, this, this part is entitled scouting report. So verse 25. So after exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, and indeed it is a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's the kind of fruit it produces. but. Hmm, but the people living there are powerful. Their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Let me pause here again. Let's use back the closing store. Clothing store. So suppose I go into this place that the Lord says, I'm going to own a store. I see all the fruit of the land. I see how it, I can produce fruit. But then I start to look at the giant brands that are there. How am I going to compete with these brands? I mean, they are strong. They're fortified with money. How am I going to deal with it? I mean, I don't know, you know, but this might be too big for me. Let's continue. Verse 29. The Amalekites live in the Negev and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land. We can certainly conquer it, he said. But the other men who had explored the land with him disagreed. We can't go up against them. They are stronger than we are. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we travel through. Notice now the report is changing. They don't mention the fruit of the land. And this is where you have to know, discern gossip. Whether it's gossip in your head or gossip from others about this land that you're supposed to walk into, this promise you're supposed to walk into, right? If, it's, if the report is all bad, you need to look into yourself and say, what did God tell me? Okay. Because God has been promising generations upon generations from Abraham until, this, Abraham until this generation that he is giving them this land. 
The land we travel through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. All the people we saw were huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Now, if you just give me a minute, I'm going to just run this ad again while I look for a particular scripture for you. Okay, I'm looking for a scripture in Joshua. I think it's Joshua 1 or 2. So I'm just asking you, bear with me a little because this is very important. I'm going to read again that last part. Verse 33, it says, We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. But right after that, they say, and that's what they thought too. Now, me have a question for them. They did ask them that. Did they ask them that? Oh, you see us? All right. Watch. All right, okay, I found the scripture. It is in Joshua 2, verses 2, sorry, verses 8 to 12, and I'm going to read that to you. Before the spies laid down for the night, this is Rahab hiding the spies. Before the spies laid down for the night, she went up on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and there is a great, as a great fear of you has fallen on us. So all that, that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We heard how the land, the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sihon and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below below now please swear to me by the lord that you will show kindness to my family because i've shown kindness to you all right no that was a new living translation for you to get what i'm saying i'm gonna have to look at the king james translation because there's a particular statement that's mentioned here Uh, in uh, that Rahab said to the men, let me just find it here. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I'm not finding it in the King James Version, but this is that statement that said, we were as, we felt, we felt like, Listen, man, your life in Christ is not about what you feel like. It's what the word of God said. It said next to them, we felt like grasshoppers. And that's what they thought too. Yet in the scripture I'm looking for, in this very scripture, I can't remember the translation. Let me just take a quick look at the NIV to see if it is there, if that's where I saw it. But the scripture, I'm going to just say what it is, was... We were, we are like grasshoppers before you. <laughs> now remember, you know, said we felt like. Well, I me mean, just can't move from here. So, 
How much of you feel like grasshopper before where God sent you into? And the enemy is looking at you and them are feel like grasshopper. They are feeling like grasshoppers because of what them see God. Because trust me, you know, there's always a witness. And God, the, the things that God do for you is spread abroad in the land. People hear about it. People who you never even think would hear about it. They're hearing about it. And I want you to picture these people on the walls of Jericho seeing the Israelites marching towards them, 600,000 men strong and their families. The, the horizon is filled with them. And they are a little, they are afraid. The, 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 the scripture says, when we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. And why? Because the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. Now, let me tell you something. Just a little testimony here. I've been told time and time again that, oh, you know, I admire your courage for doing this and I admire your courage for doing that. But can I tell you, it's not just courage, you know. It's, as a matter of fact, I would venture to say most of what I do, it doesn't involve courage because all while me doing it, I'm afraid. But what am I standing on? I am not looking at what my emotions are telling me. I'm not listening to the voice that says, you cannot do this. I'm not listening to that at all. I am standing on a foundation of truth, and that is the word of God. And if God says that I can do this, Sylvia, I'm going to send you to do this. Sylvia, I want you to join a healing ministry. And I go, but I never pray for nobody and them heal yet. But guess what? It's not what that voice said to me. God says I'm to join a healing ministry. And if I'm to join that healing ministry, it means that I am going to be given all that I need to perform healing miracles and signs and wonders because of the Holy Spirit in me. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, Great is he that is in you. No, that's not it. Ephesians 3 verse 20 says, God will do exceedingly abundantly above everything you can think or imagine. And a lot of people stop there, but it continues to say, according to the power that worketh within you. Now, which power is that? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. So you're not doing this on your strength. You're doing it on the power of the Holy Spirit. Come on, people. God, if God assigns you to something, Every voice that is telling you, listen, I, you can't do this, you, know, you can't manage this. I don't know why you're taking this on. Don't do it. Listen, shut, tell them to shut up. Tell them to shut up because you are only keeping your ears attuned to the voice of God. So let's get back to Numbers 13. We're going to jump into Numbers 14. Well, one of my fans I know at least will be very happy. This is a longer under my tree than normal. But then the whole community now starts to listen to the voice of fear. And you've, you've heard me say it many times. It is not a sin to experience fear. It's a sin to come into agreement with the spirit of fear. The Bible does say the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear. That means there is a spirit called fear. But what did he give us? Power, love, and a sound mind. And that word in Greek means disciplined mind. And this is why the battle rages in your mind. Because if your mind is not disciplined to take all thoughts captive under the blood of Jesus that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, then you're going to be in a state of confusion. And so the whole community began to weep loud. And they cried all night. God must have been looking down and said, what do them? You know? Their voices rose in a great chorus of protest against Moses and Aaron. And here we go again. If we had only died in G Egypt or even here in the wilderness, why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Our wives and little ones will be carried off as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? <laughs> Listen to me. No. Mm -mm. Don't forget, in Egypt, you weren't really happy. Oh, by the way, the word for Egypt, the Hebrew word actually means sin or imprisonment. Okay. Um, you came out of a life of imprisonment to freedom in Christ. 
Okay, but the major buck up on little difficulty. Oh, if I was back in Egypt, boy, you know, said me never used to go hungry when me, when 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 me never save, but the minute me save, you know, um, me me, me can't go hungry. Me I go hungry every day. <laughs> complain, 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 complain. Right? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? Let's choose a new leader and go to Egypt. No. <laughs> <laughs> what I find funny about this, you know, is that they don't remember they have to cross back the Red Sea. They don't remember they're going to have to walk through a desert where there was no water because in a scripture in uh, the New Testament, I don't remember it right now, but it does say that the rock with the water followed them through the, de the desert, blah, 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 the desert, right? So the leader that they're going to choose, they better know he must be able to part the Red Sea. And for that, God have to be with him. <laughs> and going back to Egypt, to what? To what? How are you going to get water? How are you going to fight those armies that you went through? Because it wasn't you who fought and won. It was God who fought your battles for you. How are you going to do it without God? So for all who are tempted to backslide, remember this part. And may, I'm going to suggest a... Uh, a video that I have called Backsliding and How to Recover. Okay? Now, verse 5. Moses and Aaron fell down on the ground before the whole community of Israel. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, tore their clothing. That's how distressed them was. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land and if the lord is pleased with us he will bring us safely into that land and give it to us it is a land flowing with milk and honey do not rebel against the lord do not be afraid of the people of the land they are only helpless pray to us they have no protection but the lord is with us do not be afraid of them but they're so caught up in their emotions and their feelings that they are ready now to stone Joshua and Caleb. And then, bam, the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to all the Israelites at the tabernacle. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? Will they never believe me even after all the miraculous signs I've done among them? I will disown them and destroy them as a plague. Then I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they are. Now, the very people... But them want stones. stone. Start beg the Lord for them. Moses objected. What would the Egyptians think when they hear about it? They know full well the power you displayed in rescuing your people from Egypt. Now if you destroy them, the Egyptians will send a report to the inhabitants of the land who have already heard that you live among your people. They know, Lord, that you have appeared to your people face to face and that your pillar of cloud hovers over them. They know that you go before them in the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Now, if you slaughter all these people with a single blow, the nations that, <laughs> that heard of your fame will say, the Lord was not able to bring them into the land he swore to give them. So he killed them in the wilderness. Please, Lord, prove that your power is as great as you have claimed. For you said the Lord is slow to anger and filled with unfailing love, forgiving every kind of sin and rebellion. Boy, Moses, really, I do a begging for them. But he does not excuse the guilty. He lays the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected, even children in the third and fourth generation. In keeping with your magnificent, unfailing love, please pardon the sins of these people. Just as you have forgiven them ever since they left Egypt. No. <laughs> poor Moses. All I can say is poor Moses. Because the amount of time him have to beg for these stubborn, hard-hearted people. And before we go on judging them, you know. Ask yourself how many times you have been stubborn and hard-hearted before God. Ask yourself how many times you believe him for a million dollars, but you don't believe him for bus fare tomorrow. Ask him how many times you have believed him for great things, but the little things just start fret and worry and carry on. You know, I have a friend in my community, you know, who told me that she thinks of me as an example of faith. I have had times when I don't have money to go to work and I put on my clothes and I go to the bus stop. You know, I, I must go to work and I must come home. So I go to the bus stop and I say, Lord, I need to go to work and I don't have any money. You know the thing goes, so you have to go sort me out. And before I know it, I hear somebody call me or my big brother or somebody 
or the Lord might tell me to call them and I'm saying, you need a ride to town. And I say, yes. And they come for me and I don't tell them I don't have the money, you know, but before I come out of the car, then put something in my hand. I say, so I look at lunch money here. And before I even spend that, because, you know, by the time I'm at work, I'm going to come across somebody who's hungry. So I'm going to buy lunch for them. Chances are I'm not going to have no lunch for myself, but invariably somebody bring me lunch. And before you know it, I get a ride home and I come home with money in my hand. Sometimes I come home to money. Hello. God is able. God is able. So I think I just want to finish up the journey today. So let me just continue with this. So the Lord says to Moses, I will pardon as you have requested. Understand the value of intercession? Because you see, and it's not it's okay to remind God of his word. Not that him forgetting about said, Lord, remember you said. Remember you said, remember your word says, you know, people mock me because I'm having faith in God for something. He promised me a vehicle and the people mock me, people mock me. But guess what? I stand on the word that says he who has faith in the Lord shall never be ashamed. Right? So I'm expecting it. I know why I haven't gotten it. The Lord show me certain things in my own character that needed to be dealt with. So may I deal with them, but we still, I believe God. Because he said, and he showed me no uncertain ter terms that I am getting this. All right. So God said, but surely as I live and as surely as the earth is filled with the Lord's glory, not one of these people will ever enter the land. They have all seen my glorious presence and the miraculous signs I perform both in Egypt and in the wilderness. But again and again, they have tested me by refusing to listen to my voice. No, ask yourself. How many times have you been disobedient? You want to go around the wilderness again and again and again, never coming into the promise because every time you reach that point, you are scared and you don't do what the Lord tells you to do. You're afraid to take that step. Listen, there's a thing called a leap of faith. And there's a, there's a, um, a movie Indiana Jones movie, I think it's the last, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And there's a point when he is at the cliff. He can't turn back. And there's a chasm across to where he has to go. And he listens to the riddle and he realizes he has to take a leap of faith. Now, as far as he can see, there is nothing there. But he takes the leap of faith and what he ends up on is a bridge that takes him across the chasm. But from where he stood, he couldn't see it. But the camera angle gave us a different perspective. Sometimes you have to ask the Lord, show me a different perspective. Why am I not seeing what you have said? Because I know it must be there because you said it. So Lord, change my perspective. When you do that, then you're able to see the thing that he has promised you. You're able to see it with his eyes. Ask him to give you his eyes, give you the heavenly vision that you can see it from his point of view. Now, he says, but my servant Caleb has a different attitude than the others have. He has remained loyal to me, so I will bring him to, into the land he explored, and his descendants will possess their full share of the land. Now turn around. Don't go toward the land where the Amalekites and Canaan live, Canaanites live. Tomorrow you must set out for the wilderness in the direction of the Red Sea. All right. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to end here. But next week on number three, we shall pick up at verse 26 where we left off. And that will be the final part of the journey series. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I'm sorry, I could not be here live. I had a meeting that could not be um, changed, but I do thank you for coming into the stream. I thank you for being here. I thank you. I hope that this really blesses you. I hope it gives you a new perspective. All right, so see you next week on number three.